Hi, Luntseef. Um, Mr. Crook here, reporting to you from um, the moon, as you can see around me here. Um, myself, Miss Walters and uh, Mrs. Hume, we've been set on a very important mission um, to work out what's actually going on in space. Um, we're a bit worried about Mrs. Hume at the moment, as you can see, she's a little bit lost. Um, but myself and Miss Walters have found where we're going, so hopefully by the end of this, Mrs. Hume will have, will have found us and we can um, explore space together. I'd like to introduce you to Wendy and Gemma from Darsbury Labs, and they're going to guide us through um, this exciting exploration. Sick. Hello. Um, so, so, sorry, I was just going to ask, first of all, um, <laughs> what, what is it that first interested the two of you in space? So I guess really, um, I've loved looking up at the stars and I've loved space all of my life because I'm, I come from a big family and we used to go camping a lot when I was a child. And it was something we used to do every night after our evening meal, we put the tent up and we lie down on the grass and my parents would just get us all to look up at the night sky. And we used to work out patterns in the stars. And it was such a lovely thing to do in the in the summer evenings. And I think that experience has always stayed with me. So to this day, I still love looking up at the night sky. I think for me, um, it was when I first started working at Darsbury Laboratory that I really got into space because I just love learning about some of the science and engineering that um, that our organisation was involved in. So I think I've always been quite interested in space and then it really, really took off when I started working at the lab. Yeah, so we'll tell you a little bit about Darsby Laboratory now. I think Gemma's got a little slide that she can put up to show you. Um, some of the children and families might know where it is. So it's right near the expressway in Runcorn, probably only about 10 minutes from Lunt's Heath. Um, and I've worked there for a very, very long time. Gemma's got the picture up there. It's a beautiful picture of our laboratory. We're really, really proud of it. It's an amazing place to work. And I've worked there. It's the only job I've ever had. I've always worked there because I enjoy it that much that I never wanted to leave. <laughs> Gemma? Yeah, I've worked there about three years now. Um, I absolutely love working with Wendy. Um, so we normally go in through this door here every morning. But um, not at the moment, we're working from home at the minute. Yeah. So to tell you a little bit more about Darsby Laboratory, um, well, we build machines that can accelerate particles to near the speed of light. We can magnify material up to 10 million times right down to the atomic level. So basically, we're looking at some of the smallest things that we know of. Um, and the reason that we do this is we want to understand how things work and what material is made of. And if we do that, we can improve the world around us. But we can't do that unless we can analyse things. So we have really powerful computers to help us do that. And there's no point running experiments if you can't observe and measure them. So we build technology that can help us do that. And we're really, really good at that at Darsby Laboratory. And once we get results from our experiments, we like to share them. So we share them with businesses, with universities, and anybody that's running experiments that we can help them with, we do. So we're really proud of the work that we do there. And today, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about space. Now, space science, we don't do that at Darsbury, but we have other laboratories around the country uh, that get involved in space science. And we think it's a really great thing to talk about while you're working from home or in school and um, during these difficult times. It's quite a nice thing to think about because the sky has been amazing lately with the weather being so good. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to hand you over to Gemma, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the sky in the daytime. Right. Okay. Can I just check? Um, I'm feeling OK on um, the planet here. Miss Waters, are you OK? I'm fine, apart from my teeth, I think the teeth are part of it as well well that sometimes <laughs> happens with space travel um i've heard so don't worry about that <laughs> things um, happen <laughs> mrs hume you're slowly disappearing out of you we're just checking you're still on course to meet us here i'm still here and floating around having fun good <laughs> happy to hear it excellent okay so i'm gonna actually start out with a little bit of a quiz because i think that's quite a fun way to start out and we would do this in um in our normal planetarium show so it's just like if we were doing it in real life and my first question to you is and i want everyone at home listening to this to join in as well 
I want you to think about different objects which you might see in the daytime sky. So if you were to look out of your window during the day, what sort of things would you be seeing in the sky? So have a little bit of a think about that. I've had a think myself and I've got some clues for you. So can you guess what some of these objects are that I've been thinking of? I think I've got three of them. I've got three. I've got four, I think. No, you've not. I've got three. <laughs> one. <laughs> well, go on then, Wendy. What's your one? Uh, I've definitely got, fingers crossed, the moon. Because the you moon? can see the moon in the daytime. Absolutely right. Yeah. So this is um, this one here is the moon. You can see the moon in the daytime. Absolutely right. Um, what about you, Miss Walters? What? I've got a um, bird, I think. Yep. Lots of birds. Yeah, you can see birds flying around. Good. Um, Mr. Cook? Um, I'm going to go with sun. Sun? I think that's, um, that's a definite, that one. Yeah, so you can see the sun burning brightly in the daytime sky. Uh, what else have we got? I think I've been left with the trickier ones. You <laughs> Go on, Mrs. Hume. I've been left for Mrs. Hume with the tricky ones. <laughs> I'm just looking at the one at the bottom corner beginning with A. That's Is a long a one. Oh, I've not got that one. No? No, it's hard, that one. Well done, Mrs. Hume. Oh, that is aeroplane. You were left with a tricky one there, but um, you got it, so that's great. I've got some clues for you as well. Ah. So does that give you an idea as to what these two middle ones could be? You can shout them out. Rainbow. Rainbow. Rainbow and leaves. And lots of rainbows in windows at the moment that I've seen around and about. Yeah, that's a really topical one, isn't it? Um, oh, my screen's gone a bit strange. Bye, Bear Mrs. Me. Humes. I'll try, I'll try and fix <laughs> <them>. my teeth. <laughs> Strange things happen in space. Well, that's let's, it, yeah. Let's see if we can fix that for you. <laughs> Expect the unexpected when you're flying around the planets. Well, this is what we've learned on our trip so far, that um, we just don't know what's out there. So these things do happen. We've just got to do our best to get on, haven't we? Yeah. During this mission. <laughs> okay, so I've tried resharing my slideshow now. Now, can you see what's on my screen? Picture of the nighttime sky. Um, not at the moment. No. I can't, no. Mm. Okay. This at Houston, we have a problem moment. <laughs> That's fine. It happens. Houston, we have an internet problem at the moment. <laughs> However, Mrs. Hughes is getting any looking of that? better because you can see most of the head now. <laughs> not, not at the moment, Gemma. Hmm. How strange. Sorry about this. So, what I'll do at this moment, I'll stop recording. And we can start recording again for the second part once we finish. Yeah, no problem. The presentation. Okay. okay, so I have now got a picture of the nighttime sky, and I'd like you to have a think about different objects which you might see in the nighttime sky. And again, I've got some clues of objects that I've been thinking of. You might have some different ones, but I'd like you to try and guess mine, please. So what do you think these could be? So I'm going to start off without the clues and then I'll bring in the clues a little bit later. Let's see how you fare. This is a bit harder. I think some of our unseeth children have to help us with this one back down on earth. Mm, has one got something to do with maybe a chocolate bar? Oh, <laughs> oh. yes. Mm. One. Which one might that be? Is that Milky Way? This one here is Milky Way, absolutely right. So the Milky Way is the name of our galaxy and you would only see this if you were really, really lucky. You'd have to have really dark skies. Maybe if you were out camping um, in the countryside or something, then you might have a chance of seeing it. And it's like a big, bright band of stars across the night sky. But that's the name of our galaxy. Uh, that's a good one to start things off with. 
Uh, any others? I've got no? one. I've got oh, go one. on, Wendy. Can I pinch the same one that I had in the daytime sky, which is moon? Mm. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so that's a bit of a cheeky one, isn't it? Because moon is in both. So, yeah, there's the moon. Good. Time to bring up the clues, do you reckon? I, I'm going to go big. Oh, go on. I'm going to have a guess at the bottom middle. Right. Okay, so I'm going to put my Mr. Science title on the line here and <laughs> go for Constellation. Absolutely yeah. excellent. Uh, so, oh, my hands. <laughs> <laughs> a constellation is a pattern made up by stars in the night sky. We're going to be talking about those um, a lot more in just a moment. So I'm really glad that you found that one. Uh, any others? Got some clues now. Ah, it's one of the easy ones. <laughs> Bat? Yeah, I saw some bats flying over my head the other evening, actually, when I was in my garden. Oh, uh, as well. They fly really, really fast. Yeah, they're so fast, aren't they? Uh, any others? We've got these two left here. Mrs. Hume might not know the bottom one because she's not arrived at a planet yet. She's still floating in space, but um, <laughs> planet for the bottom left. I'm still floating. <laughs> yep, yeah, planet. Oh, and the last one is satellite. And actually, that's a picture of the International Space Station. And sometimes you can actually see that flying overhead. Uh, that's where Tim Peake visited when he went into space. Been on the news quite a lot lately as well, hasn't it, the ISS? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that is my quiz over with, although I do have one last question. So I'm a bit of a Disney fan, and there is a fairly recent Disney film where one of the main characters uses constellations, patterns made up in the night sky, to help navigate around the sea. And my question is, does anyone recognise which Disney film this is from? Mm. And I love Disney films. I do. I think Miss Walters know. knows it as well, though. I do. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you go. I'll let you go, Miss Walters. Moana? Yes. Moana. <laughs> Wasn't that I was going to say a Toy Story. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it's such a good film. Did you well, watch, watch The other Weekend for the first time? Same. Did you? Same. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Awesome songs in it. Um, yeah, so that is from Moana. So Moana is a, uh, a stargazer as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand over to Wendy, who's going to talk a little bit more about the constellations. So thanks, Wendy. Over to you. Okay, brilliant. So I'm going to introduce now um, some software that we use in our mobile planetarium. Can you see that on the screen? Yes. yes. The laboratory there. We have a planetarium at work and basically it's like a big tent. You blow it up with earth and you can walk inside of it. You can fit about, fit about 30 children in there. And we have a projection system, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that projects the stars onto the inside of the dome and we call it a mobile planetarium. And the software is amazing and you can download it for free off the internet, but you can also download it to put just on a normal computer. And I've got it on my laptop here today. So unfortunately we haven't got the planetarium sadly, um, but we do have the second best, which is having it on the laptop here. So this is how we would see it in the dome. And this is Darsby Laboratory. You might recognize it here is the tower. Can you see that hidden behind the tree there? And this is the front of the building that Gemma was mentioning earlier that we go in in the morning. We park our cars here and we walk through here. And Lunt's Heath, like I say, is only about 10 minutes from these buildings. So what I want to point out to you, um, this is round about May time. I've set it on the date here. You can see at the bottom it says the 19th of May. And the reason I've done that is I wanted to make sure there was two objects in the sky because the sky changes every single day. And I wanted to set it on a date where we could see two, these two objects in the sky. Um, it says Warrington here, but Warrington and Halton are both in the same part of the world. And the time on the clock here is round about midday. It's just coming up to midday, quarter to 12. So about lunchtime. Beautiful blue sky, no clouds. 
Now there are two objects there in the in the sky and I'd like you to tell me what you think they are. Well I'm going to take the easy one I'm going to go with the sun. Oh well you just took mine. Oh sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking, is that the sun and is the other one the moon? I'm yes. Not sure. Well done. That is the moon because, as we said earlier, you can see the moon in the daytime. And uh, the sun is shining brightly, but it's shining onto the moon and the moon is reflecting the sun's light so we can capture it in our eyes here on Earth. So that's a really great image of those two objects in the sky. And my second question is can you see any stars in that daytime sky? I can't see any. Doesn't look like we can see any, does it? No. Mm. No, I can't. So have a little think about this because we think of stars being those lovely little twinkly things you see when the sun goes down. But Wendy, is this a trick question? It's a trick question oh. because there is one sun, one sun, one star. <laughs> I've given it away. Us. <laughs> I there thought you were talking star. about me at first when you said one star. <laughs> <laughs> there is one star in that picture and that is, or if you all say it together. The, the sun. sun. The sun. <laughs> exactly. The sun is our star. And there it is, bold and beautiful in the daytime sky. One star. There are other stars there. It's just we can't see them because of the sun is shining on our atmosphere and there's light bouncing around everywhere. So we can't actually see the stars that are in, in the sky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pan round here and I'm going to look towards the west. Get that tree into the middle of the screen. And I'm going to take the time forward ever so slowly. You see the clock down here. Because what I want to do is I want to move time forward. So, oh, see the moon moving there? Mm -hmm. And in a minute now, you will see the sun appear in this area. And what I want you to remember is it looks like the sun is actually moving. But in actual fact, the sun isn't moving. It's the earth that is moving. The earth is spinning, which makes it look like the sun is moving across our sky. So the sun is setting there behind that tree and this is a really beautiful time of night. This is a time of night that we call twilight or sunset and we've seen many sunsets at Darsby Laboratory uh, like this um, and it's very very beautiful and what I want you to look for in that lovely sky is the first objects that start to appear and what I want you to remember because Unfortunately, we live um, in quite a built up area near Manchester and Liverpool and there are lots of buildings and lots of light. We have street lights, we have car lights, we have businesses, we have shops. And sometimes that light gets in the way of the sky a little bit and we call it light pollution. And it's quite hard sometimes to see those lovely stars if you're in a really bright area. And as Gemma said before, sometimes you have to go out further into the countryside. Um, but if ever you get a chance to do that, you will see different types of stars. Um, but we have had some really good ones recently because the weather's been so great. So it's not all bad. So I'm going to go forward in time a little bit. If you can see now, this is about quarter past 11. Now remember, this is getting to a time of year when the days are really, really long. So it goes dark a lot later. So it's going to be around about 10 o'clock when you first start seeing, seeing the, the first object. So keep your eye on the time and look around this area. Time is marching forward here. And keep your eye out to see when those first stars start to appear. Half past nine. Still looking. Sun is going down and down. Oh, oh. I can see one. I can see one. Oh. Here, 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 and there's something really big here. So I'm going to stop time there. Now this is a really big object that was hiding behind the tree. And actually, if that tree wasn't there, we'd have spotted that object straight away because that would have been the first thing that you would have seen. What do you, do you think that object is? It looks bigger and brighter than all of the other objects. It looks like a really bright star. 
Doctors? I'm going to guess a planet. Right, Mr. Crook, well done. Oh, yes. <clears throat> that is just what I was looking for. This is the first object that you see in the night sky at this time of year. It's called the evening star or the morning star because it's the first object you see in the evening and it's the last object you see in the morning before the sun comes up. But it's actually not a star, it's a planet. And this is the planet Venus. So there's one thing you might have learned already, that really, really bright object that you see in the night sky at dusk and everybody stares at it because it looks so beautiful. And another thing, <coughs> excuse me, um, sometimes people say, how do you know the difference between a planet and a star? Well, stars appear to twinkle. Mm. Stars are very, very, very far away, but outside of our solar system. And they look like tiny little pinpoints of light. And that light has to travel a long, long way to get to us here on Earth. So it's traveling for billions of miles and then it has to get through our solar system and then it has to get through our atmosphere to arrive here on Earth. And our atmosphere is actually quite dense. And what happens? The light from the stars starts to refract. In other words, it bends and it bends and it bends as it comes through the different layers of our atmosphere. And that kind of zigzag refraction makes it look like it's taking a zigzag path and it makes it look like it's twinkling. So a planet is a lot closer to us and it's not a pinpoint of light, it's more like a disk in the night sky. And it's different because stars emit their own light, like our sun. But planets reflect the light of their nearest star. So Venus is quite near to the sun really, and the sun is reflecting the light from it. So it doesn't twinkle quite as much because it's a lot closer and it seems to be a lot bigger because it is closer. So I hope that's helped you sort of work out now. Is it twinkling? Does it look like a pinpoint? Does it look a little bit bigger? And that might help you figure out whether you're looking at a planet or a star. So what I'm going to do now, um, everything here is getting in the way. We know that the sun has just dipped on the horizon. So I'm gonna get rid of the ground. I'm gonna get rid of the earth completely. Um, and just watch what happens when I do that. Now, can you see where the sun is here? If I bring the earth back up again, it's set and dipped on the horizon, on the, on the other side of, of, it's moving really. Well, we're moving, which makes the sun looks like it's moving, but it's actually dipped on the horizon. Um, so take the ground away and it's still quite bright. So I'm gonna take the horizon away as well. And the sun is kind of, distracting me a little bit there so I'm actually going to take that away as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just drag the sky up a little bit because there's a set of constellations here. They were below on the horizon so you can't see them quite so well at this time of year but between November and February you get a really good view of this constellation. This here is one of the most famous constellations. Um, it's a Greek constellation and I'm going to give you a clue as to what it's called because I want you to look for three stars in a row. And if you can spot three stars in a row around about this patch, point at it if you sat at home, if you're looking at the screen or if you're in the classroom, point at the three stars that you can find in a row. Now I'm hoping that what you're looking at is these three stars here. Oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. So does anybody know what that is called? Is it the Arayu? Brilliant. That is exactly what I was looking for. Well, well done. I'm very impressed at that, Mrs. Hume. Well I done. Did. I definitely didn't get that. I'm really impressed. <laughs> um, yes, that's my belt. So Orion is a hunter in the night sky. This is a Greek constellation and he is absolutely huge. On this screen here, he doesn't look very small. I'm going to point him out for you because it's hard to work out just like this. So we've got one shoulder here, one shoulder here. We've got his waist with his belt. We've got one leg here, one leg here. We've got an arc of stars here because Orion is a hunter. So we might have a bow and arrow or he might have a shield or the fleece of an animal over his arm. Um, and then he has, it's very difficult to see here, but he has his arm up in the air because he has a big club. Now, I still think that's quite hard to see. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join it all together. So that's a little bit easier to see now. One shoulder, the other shoulder, a little tiny head, waist, one leg, another leg. As you would draw a stick man, there's a shield or his bow and arrow or his fleece. And then there's his arm up in the air with a club. So I'm going to add the artwork, which will really help. There we go. That's an artist impression of what we think Orion might have looked like. Of course, this is a story. He wasn't actually real, but it helps us recognise those patterns in the night sky. Can I ask, Wendy, is that something that um, the children back down on Earth can spot in the night sky as we yes. move into October and November? Yeah, more in the winter months. I did see him round about when we first went into lockdown, round about March and April. It's hard now because the sun is still shining quite late. And by the time the sun goes down, he's dipped below the horizon. Right. Um, but you'll get a really good view of him um, later on in the year. So there he is in all his glory. I'm going to take the artwork away because um, what I want to point out to you, this is a great constellation, but it's really, really interesting for our astronomers to, to look at this particular constellation. There's quite a lot happening there. I don't know if you can notice, but there's two really bright stars. And this one here looks kind of an orangey, reddy colour. And this one here looks like a sort of whitey, bluey white. And the reason for that is these are two very, very different stars. They're very, very bright, two of the brightest stars in the night sky, actually, but they're very different in colour. And the reason for that is this one here is getting quite old. It's burning up a lot of its fuel now. And it's getting to the end of its life and it's getting bigger and bigger because as stars burn the fuel up, they do grow in size. So it's an absolutely ginormous star, this one. Um, but it glows a different colour because it's burning up its fuel. This one down here, um, called Rigel, is brighter. It's shining very, very bright because it's still got a lot of fuel to get through. So two different stars with two different type of chemical makeup because of the, the stages that the star's life cycle is at. And the other thing I want to point out, oh, before I go on from there, we haven't mentioned what the name of this star is, and I'm going to pass over to Gemma here because this is one of her favourite stars. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so this is one of my favourite stars. It's called Betelgeuse, um, and so much so that I actually called my cat Betelgeuse. Um, I only found out fairly recently that actually that used to mean giant's armpit, and I think looking at that picture, I should probably have noticed that I'd called my cat Giant's Armpit. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good story. And in actual fact, yes, it is called the Giant's Armpit in Arabic. But this, um, this star here, Rigel, is the Giant's Left Foot. So they're, they're called things for a reason. Um, so I'm going to take the artwork away because the other thing I want to point out on this constellation is this area here. So we've got the belt. But off the belt hangs a sword here. And these stars here are where the sword is located. So if I just, I want to zoom in on this here because this is the sword. If we use our telescopes to zoom in, um, we can see much, much more. If I go in even closer, um, this is really strange because it just looked like a group of stars at first, but when you zoom in with the telescopes, it looks completely different. So what do you think that looks like? Oh. Hmm. It looks like a cloud, like a sort of colorful cloud. It Obviously does, it looks like, yeah, a sludge, yeah. Yeah. Do you think they look- I can see an apple. An apple? Mm, with a little okay. bit of a- I don't know, oh. cork and, yeah, and I guess a little, yeah, a little bit of a... a you mean the whole apple. thing looks yeah. like a round apple? Mm. Do you know, I've never heard anybody say that before, but that's going to stay in my head now. That's such a good, a good um, idea that it does, it does look like an apple. I can see what you mean with that. It also looks like there's something shining here, almost like it's shining through a dust cloud, like Gemma said. Mm. Seems to be quite a lot of these... Like a Christmas decoration. Yeah, 
It's really beautiful, isn't it? Well, in actual fact, this is called the Orion Nebula. And a nebula is a great word. Um, it's actually where new stars are formed. So as you can see, there are lots and lots of stars around here and it's really shining bright. It's almost like a star factory. So the next time you look, if you get a chance to look um, at Orion, you'll be able to see um, that in that one area of the sky, there's so much going on. And we need powerful telescopes to see a lot of that. So I'm going to bring Orion back up again because he's amazing. Well, and I don't, know if, I don't know if you noticed, but when I clicked on this word here... Okay there, Mrs Hume. I was just going to ask a question, Wendy. Yeah. I'm just wondering for the children, is it better if the children were to lie outside on the grass and look up to the sky? Oh, yes. Stars, or is it yes, better? absolutely. Lying you down? Know, yeah, definitely. And it's, it hurts your neck when you're looking up all the time. Yeah. So I, I prefer to lie down. If you get a nice comfy blanket or a coat or something, you can make yourself comfortable. And what you have to do is be really patient. Because if you sit there for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, you start seeing things. You see, well, there's not many aeroplanes going over at the moment, but you see satellites, you see shooting stars, lots and lots of things that are happening out there. And it just makes you really appreciate it. I think That's I'll try that tonight with Mr. Hume. Yeah. And I'll let you know, Mr. Crook and Miss Walters, what I saw last night. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, yeah. yeah. Me too. Oh, I hope the clouds are uh, clear for you to do that. That would be amazing. So, um, I was just about to say, this star here is called Bellatrix. And Bellatrix might mean something to some people because it's quite a well-known name because it's a character out of a really famous film. Or book. That's what I was thinking. Mm. Does anybody know what that book might be called or that film? I've not got this one. Um, is it Bellatrix Lestrange from Harry Potter? It certainly is. Um, one of Gemma's favourite books. You can tell I'm not a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> Well, it's quite unusual. A lot of people are, but honestly, if you've that's why you've been sent, sent out into space. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you're right. Bellatrix is a female warrior um, uh, in the Harry Potter books. So we've got uh, a Harry Potter character name here, and this star here. If we follow through the Orion's belt and we come to this really, really bright star here, it's another bright star in the night sky. It's called the Dog Star. And this is in what we call Ursa Major. And I'll just, I'm going to take the artwork away just so we can bring it up just with the lines of the constellation. And this is called Sirius, which is the dog star because it's in the constellation of the big dog. And as we know, Sirius is another character in the Harry Potter books. Um, I'm we going were to talking talk about this, <laughs> weren't we, recently? <laughs> we were. You can do a, a whole tour of the night sky just referencing Harry Potter. So we've got Bellatrix, we've got Sirius, and um, there's a constellation called Draco, as in Draco Malfoy. Mm. Um, we even found something called Hagrid a few weeks ago. Uh, so I think when J.K. Rowling was uh, looking up at the night sky, she was getting quite a lot of inspiration for, for her book. She certainly was. That's maybe an idea next time I know my class when we're writing um, we're writing a story and we normally sit for 10 minutes trying to think of characters' names and people's names. So maybe we just need to take some inspiration from the stars. Oh, that would be so That's good. Such a good idea. I love that idea. Yes, absolutely. So here we have Orion with Sirius the big dog. But the big dog does not like to go hunting unless a little dog in Canis Minor um, comes with him. Did I call that Canis Major before or uh, Ursa Major? I'm getting mixed it, up. Because there are two. It's, it's Canis Major, isn't it? Did I say Ursa Major? I think you might have done. I might have done. Well, that's wrong because it is Canis Ma Major. Gosh, I need to get my book out and read it all. Um, <laughs> so many words to remember. There so, is an Ursa Major, isn't there? There is an Ursa Major. So if I've said that wrong, I've just corrected myself. So there we have the two constellations Big Dog and Little Dog. Now, if we follow through the back of the big dog, through Orion's belt, through the shield, we come to this really bright star here. 
Now this is the eye of the animal that Orion is hunting. And Orion is, you know, he's ready to go now. And this animal is charging down on him. What animal do you think that might be? Hmm. I've had crocodile horns. Something with horns, yeah, definitely got horns. Oh, we've had that's... crocodile, we've had scorpion, we've had donkey. I was going to say snake, but I've not seen many snakes with horns. <laughs> no. Hmm. Any other a guesses? Horn. An animal with horns, what could it be? Oh, I've got a clue actually, because I know what it is. But for anyone who's got a birthday in late April or early May, this will be your star sign. Ah. Mm. Is that your birthday, Mrs. Hume? It is. It is. Oh. It's mine as well. Oh. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> this is right. time for birthdays. <laughs> I think you lot have got it then. <laughs> so this is actually called Aldebaran, the, the eye of the bull. This is Taurus, the bull. And there he is in all his glory, charging down on Orion. He's really huge in the night sky. This is quite hard to make out in the night sky, but you will find the V. And the V, if you think of it as being the snout of the animal, you will find that bright star, Aldebaran. So there is quite a lot going on in that one part of the sky that you can work out. And these stories really help weave it all together. The last thing I want to show you before we do leave this part of the presentation is see this little group of stars here. This is my favorite tiny, tiny little constellation. And this is called, for anybody that doesn't know, the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. And in Japan, it's called Subaru. So it's got lots of different names depending on the origin of the stories. Um, but it's a constellation that I look for when it's, when it's in view. I always look for them because this is what I remember from being a child. And if we zoom in on this part of the sky, um, as you can see, there are many, many, many more stars than you would think because it's called the Seven Sisters because we think we can see about seven with the naked eye, six or seven stars, 11 if you've got really supersonic eyesight. But when we use our telescopes, there are about 250 there. So if ever you get to spot them, you might remember that, that they are um, much more prevalent in that constellation than you think. And one way of remembering where they are is if you imagine Taurus has got all these tiny little bees on its back, biting and nipping and buzzing away and really making Taurus irritable. That's why one way of remembering that the Pleiades is within the Taurus constellation. So the final thing I want to do before we leave this part is to actually bring up all of the constellations Ooh. for you. I'm gonna hand over to Gemma here because she loves this part of the, um, the show. Yeah, this is my favourite part. We'll always do this when we're in the planetarium because we've just talked about just a handful of constellations, but there's loads out there. So I think it's really nice to just get them all up so you can see how many there are. Um, and I think it's quite exciting to choose one which you think you like the look of. So if you're interested in um, Ursa Major, the Big Bear, or Leo the lion or what this kind of sea monster is kind of near the center you can go away when you're at home and find out a little bit more about that constellation because each of these constellations has got a story attached to it and this is what I really like about stargazing is that you've got the science but you've also got the kind of storytelling aspect as well yeah. So that's something that you can do yourselves, um, which I think is really, really nice. Absolutely. And if anyone does manage to find some information, I know myself, uh, Miss Waters and Mrs. Hume would love to um, see that. Um, if you want to tweet us and when we get back down to Earth, we'll be able to pick that up and we'll be able mm -hmm. to see what you've been searching for on your favourite constellation, which would be great. There's plenty to yeah, choose yeah. from there, isn't there? I didn't um, realise there were so many. Yeah, oh, the, the, the sky is just full of these stories and these patterns. And one thing I want you to notice before we actually leave it completely is these um, two constellations here. We have Ursa Major, not Canis Major, Ursa Major. This is the constellation of the Big Bear. And we also have the Little Bear here. 
And I want you to just make a note here of this constellation because we'll be talking about that a little later on. So I'm going to hand over to Gemma now because we're going to go on to the next part of the session. Can I just ask a question again? Of course. Mm. Leave it quick. Can I just ask, is there a particular constellation that I will be able to see easier tonight for me to look out for? Are yes. Are more prominent than others? So it, it is this one, the Great Bear. If you, I'm going to talk about this at the end of the show when we've finished after Gemma's session. But this is the part of the constellation that you will be able to see tonight. In fact, you can see this at any time of the year. And this is the really important part. And you can, you can go and look for this tonight if there's no clouds. And I'll tell you how to do that at the final part of the session today. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. That was lovely. I really enjoy that star show. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we can get this working again. <laughs> oh, I'm not having much fun with this today. What's happening to Mrs. Hume? She seems to be morphing in there to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever see her again, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how is that for you? Right. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so, Wendy, you wanted to talk about scales, didn't you? Yeah. So, just before we move on to Gemma's part of the session, um, I just wanted to recap a little bit because I'm assuming that some of the children will have already done about planets in school. Is that right, Mr. Crook? Yes, we study planets in year five, so some of the children will have done. Okay. But some also know lots, and there's been plenty of good work going on from yeah. um, some of the younger children as well. Yeah, okay. So the reason I've put this slide up is because I've just wanted to show you the different sizes and comparisons of the planets. On the first black square, we have Jupiter and Saturn look really, really big. And then we've got Uranus and Neptune, quite a bit smaller. So you can clearly see that Jupiter's huge. Uh, Gemma, are you able to point out with your cursor there the size of Earth? It looks like a little marble on that slide. There it is. So Earth is really tiny compared to Jupiter. In fact, you can fit Earth inside Jupiter over a thousand times. That's how big Jupiter is. So wow. that's your scale of the different planets. Pluto, tiny, tiny little spot on that screen there. So we've got Mercury. And we've it's a full got stop, isn't it? It's almost like a full stop. So that gives you an idea of the difference in scale of the size of the planets. The square next to that, we have um, the sun. And that shows us the comparison of Jupiter compared to the sun. So we know Earth can fit inside Jupiter a thousand times. I wonder how many times Jupiter can fit inside the sun. There's a great question that some of the children might want to investigate. Mm -hmm. So the sun looks massive, doesn't it? In fact, Earth just looks like a little peppercorn on that picture. It's so small, I can barely see it. You can just about see it. The third square, um, we talked about a, a star called Rigel. We have Betelgeuse and Rigel in different parts of the Orion constellation. On that square, Gosh, I can't even see myself here. Oh no, it's Sirius actually, Sirius. Mm -hmm. That white one there is Sirius. So you can see that even though it's a bright star, it's quite small compared to some of the others. And then on the fourth square, that's the one that's got Rigel in it. So this was in the constellation of Orion, that really, really bright star I was on about. And we had Betelgeuse that was the reddy, orangey color. Look how big Betelgeuse is. Massive. Compared to Rigel even though they both look quite bright because Betelgeuse is getting bigger and bigger because it's growing old. And well, it, I always um, thought that the sun was much bigger than stars when you look up in the moon. I know. It always seems to be, doesn't it? I know, but can you see on this slide that the sun is so small compared to Betelgeuse and Rigel that we can't even see it on that picture? So I just wanted to show you the different sizes of the different stars and planets just so you can get an idea in your head of the, how big some of these actually are. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Gemma now to carry on with the, the show. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. another quiz. 
<laughs> okay, so this is my really tricky check that you listened quiz. So, first question. Do you remember where the nebula was in Orion? I can tell Miss Walters knows just by looking at her. <laughs> Are you volunteering Miss Walters there? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm going to say at the bottom half. It was underneath his belt, wasn't it? I remember that, yeah. It Absolutely was. right. It was underneath his belt and hanging off of his belt in the picture anyway is a sword so it's just on orion's sword so it looks like a star when you're looking at it from a distance but when you zoom in you see this lovely nebula and next question what's happening inside the nebula Ooh. are you going for that mrs hume Ooh, I, I think I'm going to leave that one with you, I think. Yeah, I think I'm oh, leaving it with you. <laughs> thanks. I'm passing it over to you. Mm. Can I have a clue, Gemma? Please. Um, yeah, okay. So it's to do with stars. So something's happening with stars inside <gasps> of the nebula. Yes. Um, that's the one that looks like the apple. Mm-hmm and new stars are being created brilliant absolutely right well done <laughs> so it's a place where stars are made and actually mr cook i really liked it when you said that you thought it looked like an apple because there's loads of different nebulas all around the night sky and some of them have got lots of different interesting names um there's a horse head nebula oh uh, there's the Rosetta Nebula, which looks like a rose. So it's nice that you were getting a little bit creative there and thinking about what sort of shape you thought it looked like. I've not heard apple before, but as soon as you said it, I could totally see that. So that was a good one. Well, if you want to get in touch with NASA and see if they want to go <laughs> with that, I'm, I'm more than happy. I'll use my direct line to NASA and uh, <laughs> let them know about it. <laughs> Okay, so the next slide is a little bit of a spot the difference for you. So these are two pictures of the same nebula. So remember a nebula is like a big colourful dust cloud in the sky where stars are being made. So this, these are two pictures of the same nebula, but they look a little bit different because they were taken using different types of light. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a moment, but what I want you to do for now is play a little bit of a game of spot the difference. So what's different in these two images? A couple of different the things. The visible light, the colours, a lot brighter. Yeah, absolutely right. So you can see more colours in the visible light compared to the infrared light. And you can see a lot more stars in the infrared than in the visible light. Yeah, absolutely. You can see so many more stars in this picture, which is taken using infrared light. Um, so you can see more stars in the kind of background here. And also, if you just focus on this kind of object, what's different with those two? You sort of see inside it. Yeah, absolutely right, Mr. Walters. Yeah. Sorry, Miss Hume. Did you, Mrs. Hume? Did you say something then? It was Miss Walters. Oh, sorry. Okay. She said she um, saw in, you can see inside. Absolutely right. So, in the picture taking using using visible light, you can sort of see the outside of this colourful dust cloud. But using the infrared light, you can actually see inside of the nebula to where the stars are being made, which I think is quite exciting. Uh, so I'm going to explain why that's useful. First of all, I just want to explain a little bit more about what infrared light is. So it's a type of light which we cannot see. It's invisible to us. But we can feel it. So I've got a little bit of an experiment for you now. I'd like you to put your hands together and rub them really, really fast. 
Ooh, are they getting warm yet? Definitely. Mine are. Okay. So now I want you to put them really close to your face. Not touching, but so close that they are almost touching. Can you feel a little bit of heat from your hands? Mm, I can. Yeah, yeah. So that heat is actually light. That is infrared light. We cannot see it, but we can feel it. And we can build amazing telescopes and cameras which can help us see this type of invisible light. So to give you a bit more of an idea, I've got some pictures of things here on Earth which are taken using infrared light uh, to give you a little bit more of an idea. Now we think a bit more as heat, but it is actually a type of light. So we'll start off here. We've got a handprint. So what's happened here, someone's put their hand on a table and their heat has trans the heat from their hand has transferred onto the surface of the table and now it's radiating out as infrared light. So if you were to put your hand on a table ordinarily and then take it away, you wouldn't be able to see that handprint. But with an infrared camera, you can. Does that make sense? Mm. Uh, we've also got a picture of a teapot, which I think is quite useful because you can see where the hot tea is up to in that teapot. Um, we've got a picture of a cat here taken using infrared light so where you've got those kind of white and yellow colors that's where there's a lot of heat a lot of light coming out where you've got the blues and the purples that's where it's a little bit cooler so you can see here this cat has got a little bit of a cold nose but very warm paws and um, if we look at the picture of the house you can see there's lots of heat escaping through the windows but not so much through the roof um, and my favourite picture is actually one that Wendy found, which is here. This is actually a picture of a hairdryer blasting out loads and loads of hot air. I think that's a really interesting picture because that's normally completely invisible to us. But using a special infrared camera, it helps us to see the invisible. So my favourite picture is the teapot. <laughs> the water reminds me of lava coming out of a volcano. It looks like molten lava. And I wouldn't have expected it to look like that. That's such a good point. Um, in fact, when we've got an infrared camera at the lab, haven't we, Wendy? Yes. And sometimes we'll do experiments where we'll pour hot and cold water together under the camera and it looks exactly like lava and that, that's exactly the word we use. I think it looks really, really beautiful. Um, you might be able to find some pictures online about that. So that might be something that you could investigate at home as well. Um, I'm glad you pointed that out, Mrs. Hume, thank you. Um, well, the children will love to do that, bring in lots of pictures for us. Yeah, <laughs> there's some nice ones out there. Um, okay, so I'll just explain why I'm talking about this invisible type of light. So I wanted to show you a picture of this special telescope. So this is called the Webb Telescope. And this is an experiment that Wendy and I are really, really excited about because some of our scientists and engineers have actually been involved in building this telescope. It's a space telescope. So it's going to be launched up into space soon. We're not sure exactly when, but what's really special about it is that it's got an infrared camera on board. So it's going to help us to see space in a completely different ways, in a completely different way. So we'll be able to, for example, look at nebulas like the pictures I showed you and, and see them in a different way and lots and lots of other space objects. So that's the cartoon version of it. And this is the real thing. And this, again, gives you a really nice idea of scale. So this big gold hexagonal object is the mirror. And you can see just how big that is compared to all of the scientists and engineers working underneath it, which I think is really nice. Wow, it's huge, isn't it? It's absolutely massive. So here's a question 
how do we actually get something that big into space? It's a nice one to ponder. Um, do we have to big, build a really big rocket or do we have to find another solution? I think we'll have to find another solution. Yeah, so our scientists and engineers have actually come up with a really good solution. And the clue is in this mirror. Because if you notice, it's not just one piece, it's made up of lots and lots of hexagons. And what's going to happen is they're going to fold that mirror up, put it into a rocket and launch it up into space. And some people have described it as being a little bit like origami, that as soon as it gets up into space, it will begin to unfold, not just the mirror, but the whole telescope. And that's going to take a little while for, for it to unfold and then it'll have to cool down and then it'll start working, uh, which is going to be really nerve wracking for all of our scientists and engineers because it's going to be very, very far away. So if something breaks, there's not much we can do about it, which is why we're spending a lot of time testing it, aren't we, Wendy, to make sure that it's perfect. Yeah, and, and some of our scientists have been working on this for many, many, many years. It's almost like sending their own baby into space, isn't it? They're going to be very nervous about it, but it is going to be a fantastic um, time for space science. And lovely for the children growing up at a time like this when these exciting things are starting to happen again. So. I think have it's got, amazing that someone... Have we got a launch date for it yet? Um, not at the moment. We'll... Um, We'll have to keep you updated about that because we're not sure when it's going to get launched yet, are we, Wendy? No, I mean, they're hoping in the next few years, but obviously it has to go through very rigorous testing because once it's up there, if anything goes wrong with it, they can't go up to fix it. That's the worry about it. So they want to make sure it's absolutely spot on before it gets launched. So we keep waiting for updates and we've just got our fingers crossed at the moment. So we'll wait and see. I just but think it's amazing that that was built by scientists close to us and who knows something in our school might be able to in yeah. the future work on something to send a little part of them into space. Yeah I mean that's what's so wonderful about this project because it's even though it's led by NASA they came to the UK and asked our scientists to build some of the instruments that go on it which says a lot about how good our scientists and engineers are because they could have gone anywhere in the world to find these people to do this but they chose the UK and that that means a lot to us and it's oh, great yeah. to be involved so it makes me feel very proud very proud yeah uh, so i think this is the last slide and wendy this is back over to you yeah so we've talked an awful lot about patterns in the sky and constellations and different things that you can look at in the night sky but we want to make sure that you don't feel like when you do look up there that you can't remember things that we've said because some of the constellations are only visible at certain times of the the year depending on the earth's rotation but one of the constellations you can see all year round and it's this one here this in the uk we call this the the plow in some other countries they call it the big dipper because it actually looks like a big spoon or a saucepan and if i just point it out if you imagine this here oh hang on Gemma, you might have to do that bit sorry this is the handle of the pan or the handle of the spoon and this here is the bowl of the spoon or the bowl of the pan, you know, the, the bit where you put the food in. So you can see there that it is a bit like a saucepan shape. Um, there is a picture of a plough there on the other side, an uh, old fashioned plough. And you can see where the handle is. You can see the man there or the lady pushing that and the horse is pulling it along and you can see the handle. So we kind of allude to it as being like a plough, but it doesn't matter what it's called. It's still got that same shape. Now, there are two stars in the bowl of the saucepan there, and we call these the pointer stars. So if you find that shape in the night sky, that sort of saucepan-y plough shape, you can find those two pointer stars. And once you've found them, if you draw a line with your eyes, so you can use your finger in the air, but follow up and up and up and up. And if you keep following in a straight line, the first bright star that you come to is the North Star. And that's the star that is directly above our North Pole. So all the other stars look like they are moving. Um, but the North Star appears to stay still because it's always in the one position. 
So that is a really great way of being able to go out and look for something that could become very familiar to you if you practice looking at it often enough. And it won't take long, just a matter of days really, to keep looking and recognise it. You will always remember that for the rest of your life. So there you go, Miss Hume. There's something for you to look at if the clouds yeah, are. Yeah, will be tonight. Yeah, definitely. So on that note, we've come to the end of the show. Uh, there's an awful lot there that we've covered and we hope you've enjoyed it. We find that a lot of our lives are spent looking down at iPads and books and television and games. And it's not very often we have the chance to just take a moment and look up instead of down. And there's an amazing, beautiful universe out there. And there's so many things that we don't know about our universe yet. And these new instruments that we're building are going to help us discover these new things. But I hope it's inspired you to look up to think a little bit more about the world you live in and the sky that is out there and appreciate it a little bit more. So I'm going to pass over to Mr. Crook now to wrap up, but I've loved it today and I hope you've enjoyed the session too. That's been great. Yeah, and I, um, I've, I've really enjoyed my session. I want to thank yourself, Wendy and Gemma for taking, on us, taking us on this um, exciting journey into space. Um, I feel like I've, got so much more information now about the stars and I know that our children at one people will have the same as well. My only worry is still Mrs. Hume so I feel like myself and Miss <laughs> Walters are really going to have to work hard to find where she is and get back to school so we're ready to teach in the morning. Do you think I'll be back at Lunds Heath in the morning? I'm not sure whether I can get back. Or I not mean, <laughs> we'll be lucky. You look quite at home in that universe though. <laughs> if not, um, I'll let Miss Walters tell Mr. Williams that I'm um, is a teacher down. This is a teacher. And I would just like to invite any of the children, if you've got any follow-up activities or things that you want to draw, or you might want to make your own constellations, make your own stories up, you might want to find out more about some of the things we've talked about. And if you've got any burning questions that you can't answer, and you'd like one of our experts to answer for you, please send your questions in. We can actually get an expert and video them and send a recording back to you with lots of answers on. So we'd love to see some activity around this now, but I'm going to leave it with you to do it your, in your own time and your own pace. Really, how exciting. Thank you very much. That's okay. And we will see you all soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye so. for now. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.